Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics podcast. My name is Ahmed Hassan, and today, as always, I have a wonderful guest. With me is Julie Nell. Julie is a friend, a mentor, my old boss, my old business partner, and all around great person. So Julie started her career off in the RAF, but most of the time she spent in the police. Uh, she specializes in intelligence and serious organized crime and served as the force director of intelligence and the national lead for intelligence in Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabularies. Um, that was a big one. Uh, Julie has commanded numerous intelligence operations, utilizing all available techniques and assets, understanding the importance of partnership, working and stakeholder engagement. Right now, she runs B4 Secure, a private intelligence and investigative company based in London, where she focuses mainly on major fraud, investigations, due diligence, and more, which you will probably go into in the, in the podcast. Thank you, Julie, for joining. Hi, very welcome. Looking forward to having a chat. Can you start, you know, where, where it all began? Gosh, where did it all start? Well, when I was at school, I never thought I was going to end up in, in the world of security, that's for sure. I think my aspiration was to be a lorry driver, um, which I ended up doing, strangely enough, when I sort of fed into the Royal Air Force. But the journey into that was a little bit odd. I tried to get into the army first and as a young 16-year-old, and they laughed me out with their recruitment office. I don't think I was what they were looking for, shall we say. Undeterred, ended up going into the RAF recruitment office and joined as a mechanical transport driver, All right. um, which was absolutely great fun. Yeah, so I did that for a few years and through the first Gulf War, which was a, an eye-opening experience. So that was back in the late 80s. And then decided that the police seemed quite a good idea and had some friends that had gone on to it and ended up then joining the Metropolitan Police back in 1992. And the rest, they say, was history, really. I think I found my vocation. Absolutely loved it. Started off over in sort of the west side of London, Acton, Ealing, and that was in the early 90s. And found myself sort of involved in undercover police work, buying drugs, that type of thing, uh, sort of covert operations. So specialising in informant handling or CHIS, as we call it in, in, in the police, covert, covert human intelligence sources. Yeah, sort of, I found, I said, found my real interest, which was the covert side of law enforcement and intelligence gathering. Um, I had a mentor, really, though he was at a distance. I don't think he realised the impact he had on me, a guy called John Grieve. It was a commander and introduced intelligence-led policing, which was, to me, the most sensible thing that I'd ever come across in my short, well, you know, small life by then, which was what my, in my early 20s. And I totally agreed with it. And to me, intelligence has always then been a passion and something I've always followed. I'm not sure if you want me to do a whole biog going up. Yeah, I would actually. <laughs> I mean, I think people, are, that's what people tune in for and, and they're very interested. So when you joined the police, how was the experience, particularly, you know, as a, as a woman in that time? Oh, it was massively eye-opening for me. You know, I, I went from pretty sheltered upbringing. I was actually brought up on, on a farm and then to be, although the Air Force was, was, I suppose eye-opening in a way, you were very, very sort of looked after and quite sheltered still. You still sort of had a family to belong to, if you like, which was the Air Force. You were quite protected and on the base. When I was sort of pushed into the police, I remember some small child staring at me with this absolute hatred because of the uniform I was wearing. I remember being in my first fight when we got turned on by a a, a gang basically that decided they weren't going to let us do some policing that we wanted to do at a particular time and found myself in a massive fight and as a young woman to suddenly be exposed to that was 
was shocking because it wasn't me as an individual they were fighting against or they didn't know me. It was what I represented and what I, as in their eyes, stood for. So that was all quite, yeah, quite eye-opening. You also realise the bubble, I think, that you live in and perhaps a lot of people live in so much that you come across, especially in the police, is never televised or except perhaps dramatised in documentaries. And, you know, I'll see things now and people think, oh, thank goodness, you know, that's obviously doesn't happen in real life. And it does happen in real life. In fact, it's often a lot, lot worse. So I can't even watch horror films anymore. But, yeah, I think as a, as a young woman, it was... It wasn't, I, was, I wouldn't say that I came across anything worse than the guys did. There was a lot fewer of us females, but the ladies that I did work with and worked alongside were fantastic. Personally, I never had any issues with sexual harassment or any other issues. I didn't feel like I was ever singled out because I was female or didn't get anywhere because I was female. So although that is often widely sort of publicised. Personally, I've never had any of those issues at all. Mm. And I would thoroughly recommend it as, as a as a career for women. I really would. I've watched, you know, we all get the mickey taken out of us. And when you first join somewhere, it's hard. And I suppose in the early days, there was stuff that they did that, but not more towards a woman than a guy would get, you know, just mm. to not break you in, but just what do they call it? Like a like a little bit, yeah, the initiation stuff, but yeah. nothing, you know, horrendous. I mean, just mm. you know, and but the guys got that just as much as the girls. It was nothing. I, I can honestly say, I've never ever mm. singled out, and I never felt treated differently at all. Do you remember when you first got, when you first encountered organized crime? I think then you probably switched over from more serious crime. So how was that? How was that like? What was that experience? Well, it was like, like a gradual, I think, thing going into organised crime. Organised crime starts right on the streets at this low, low level. Without that okay. le- that first grade level, you know, your drugs runners, your, your dealer on the corner of, of a street, you haven't got an, a serial organised crime group. They need that outlet. They need a market. You know, for example, that's just the drug side of it. But it, it, it touches all levels. So people think suicide organised crime is just, you know, the kingpin sitting in their, their big tower surrounded by armed guards mm-hmm. with all them, you know, the Mercedes and everything else going with them. They need every level of crime to be hit generally to be able to run their empire, if you like. Mm-hmm. So to me, fighting organised crime starts right at a basic level on the streets, getting that intelligence from there and then working your way up because it's a lot easier to go in from the bottom all the way up to the top. So I was introduced to it by doing, you know, stop and searching on the streets, coming across the the drugs, gaining the informants from the street, finding out where they were getting it from, gaining trust, learning. That's where I think I I realised how, I suppose, crime networks work from the very bottom all the way through to then to state level. And obviously I can talk about sort of state level stuff, you know, later on, but... That real basic grounding to me helped fill this big jigsaw puzzle that was crime and, and organised crime. And seeing it on the coal face, so through, you know, the drugs, the overdoses, the, the dealers, all of that side, to then facing firearms and, you know, doing a stop and search one day and having a, a gun pulled on me, my partner being, you know, shot in the chest, seeing it at that level, wow. that was all to do with drugs, firearms running, that that level and I was a a beat cop you know at that point I hadn't reached the echelons of detective superintendent or you know gone into an organized crime squad or anything else that was just me doing my job as a beat cop so yeah I think it it evolves and to really understand it you need to learn that that ground that grassroots level of it. Do you think that analysts today are maybe detached from not having that that understanding from the ground? Some are. It depends how well read they are, how much yeah. interest they have in a particular crime type perhaps they're looking into. You find if, I, again, organised crime don't, doesn't stick to a crime type, they'll go where the market is 
you know, as you know, Ahmed, you know, the same guys that run the drugs and have their same roots are doing firearms, they're doing human trafficking, they're doing, Mm -hmm. so it's, they'll go where, whatever the commodity is, whether it's, oh, koala bears, humans, drugs, whatever they can make money from, they'll run it, you know, for the analyst point of view, I think people get overexcited when they hear organized crime, maybe, and don't realize that county lines is typical. County Lines is a massive organised crime network, but it's that street level that it's really, really, you know, compounded. But and I think, yeah, some perhaps don't have that recognition of of linking all of that together. I mean, if you think of if a want a state wants to sort of destabilise an area, how better do it than completely undermining a local community and filling it full of drugs? You know, I, this it's to me that link between the different levels of uh, of crime is is huge, and every, agencies, be it private sector, government sector, tend to work in silos and only concentrate in in one area. Don't share the intelligence enough, I think, to to so often make a, a, an impact. So, yeah, I think I don't think it's a discussed enough in the analytical world if you've come from a law enforcement background you will have a better understanding but then you can perhaps be so narrow that you don't aware the ge- you're not aware of the geopolitical impact that it could have and the best analysts i've i've worked with are the ones that have done a mixture of law enforcement at a, a ground level all the way through to the perhaps regional organized crime units or have an awareness of that and then have either gone on and done degrees in geopolitical or intelligence securities at a master's level where they've carried, you know, covered geopolitical issues, or they've gone military as well, which gives them a bit more of a geopolitical or a government thing. So it gives them a wider span because then they've got this really great view of what feeds, uh, what properly feeds crime, I think, from the lowest level all the way up to the top. Very interesting. I didn't think about that way. How was it to engage with informants what is that like on that level at least i loved it i absolutely so you know i've sort of handed them as you we used to have um three levels your level one which is the ones that sort of on the streets living in the states so and so forth just sort of give you a good intel on what's happening in that local area up to your level two which sort of cross border so cross county and forces to your level three informants which were UK based and perhaps overseas and I've worked at all that level all that levels from handling them recruiting them and then you know towards the end of my career as director of intelligence so I was the authorizing officer and overseeing all, all the handling you know and the controlling of, of these informants don't think people realize the impact you can have on some of these informants lives on on the human side of it if you like mm-hmm. sometimes as a handler you're the only continuity for them um and they can look at you wrongly or <laughs> rightly in some occasions i don't know as almost a confidant that helps advise them in their personal lives it's a very strange relationship um, and it's an interesting line you can walk especially with ones that are, are younger i think and, and perhaps more of that lower level but i i used to really really enjoy it Obviously, with the, the incoming of uh, Regulation Investigatory Powers Act, RIPA, which didn't come into sort of 2004, I, I was handling informants all through the 90s, so long before that. RIPA, if you like, professionalised it a lot more. And so where you were getting handlers that would perhaps have an informant for years and years and years, forming perhaps unhealthy relationships, that was taken away a lot more because it was recognised you need to have this turnover. You know, the informant doesn't belong to the handler, the informant belongs to the organisation, if you like. And I think, you know, Ripper was was really good in making sure that that helped keep those relationships a lot more healthy. I had a lot of issues when I was a controller in making sure that that relationship between handlers and informants was kept professional and and basically a business transaction, if you like. Yeah. Hmm. But no, I enjoyed it very much. I've always had a, a real fascination for that side of the work. All right. And then you, you move up through the ranks and you become a detective superintendent. 
So how does that change? What was your, how has your work changed from there on now? Okay, I'm a lot more political. Funnily enough, didn't enjoy it as much. I think the best rank I did was detective inspector. I did sort of quite a range of different, did the homicide team. I've done the sort of professional standards. I did not for very long, just under a year as well, sort of to try and understand and specialise in different sort of areas. But then came back all the, always to intelligent. The, yeah, the, the transition is interesting because you haven't got so much, I suppose, control over what really is happening operationally. But again, as a detective superintendent, still massively involved in the running of operations, the reviewing of them, making sure they're still proportionate, had budgets to consider as well. It's, it's yeah, a whole different, I think, kettle of fish. You're looking after the welfare of your team, are often working incredibly long hours under cr- incredibly traumatic circumstances. Um, so, yeah, and as well, let's not beat about the bush. You're making literally making life and death decisions, whether it's a firearms operation or whether to go in or not to go in, whether it's a contract killing op, your SIOing, a kidnap. The 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 decisions that you make, I think, are often underestimated by the public. They have a lot of time no idea what police officers do and that's sort of I suppose again the dramatic ones let alone the ones that the cops on the street probably make every day of their lives but when you move it then to detective superintendent it is it's a lot more you you are accountable for everything that that you're doing you write you have to write everything down because you don't know when it's going to end up at in in a court be it for a crime a criminal case or because you're being perhaps sued or look at looked at for not doing perhaps a decision that people agreed with so it's a it's a lot of pressure but again, incredibly rewarding. And you rely heavily on the team around you and also the people that are above you to support your decisions and to support what you what you do. Yeah, I yeah, I I enjoyed it, but again, it's a very different flavour of, of policing because you're in a leadership role and you're responsible for a lot of bodies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and from your time just Taking a step back, because you mentioned a situation where your partner mm-hmm. got shot. Yeah, I that. You... Well, I, mean, I was bless him. I was meant to be running him in stop and search. So he was. We used to call it puppy walking. I was not long out of my probation, oh, wow. to be honest. I think I'd only got about three or four years mm-hmm. in, and so he was still. He just got a year in, and we pulled over a car up in North. Had a back brake light out. They stopped for us outside the tube station. It was about half 11 at night and opened the door and it just stank of cannabis. I mean, just stank of it. So I thought, oh, it's good ones. Obviously, you know, we've got loads of reasons to, to search them now. And unfortunately, the guy, yeah, was had a gun and certainly didn't want to be searched um, and then started firing at us. It, yeah, the gun jammed. And um, so we both sort of got up to then try and accost him. And my young probationer, as he was running towards him, the guy shot him at quite close range in the chest. But no, he survived. He was in yeah. hospital for a fair few months. He was, yeah, it was pretty horrible when you, you know, lifted the guy's shirt up and you see a, a bullet hole in his, his chest. And, but yeah. I carried on running and managed to bring in the, backup that was coming along and I located the guy in Mm -hmm. some hedgerows by the tracks and managed to guide the dogs in and we still had knew he had a gun at that point but as we as I was taking the dog handler in where I'd heard the rustling it was obviously him and his mate had legged it from us I found we found the gun and then which he dropped thankfully and then we found the suspect and he was arrested and and it was a couple of trials at the Old Bailey. Um, yeah, we both got, you know, awarded mm. for it. Steve got, quite rightly, the Queen's Gallantry Medal as well. Partner. He was an amazing chap. He stayed in the police. I I didn't take any day sick. He had to. Obviously, he was in hospital with a gunshot wound. And then he went back. We made a stern stuff in the police. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I probably should have had a few days off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not gonna lie. I think um, it, it wasn't. It did affect me for a little while, but um, yeah, yeah. So that was. Yeah. That was that. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. I mean, we've known each other for so long, but I've never heard this story. So, but the intelligence, like, um, I think it would be also good for people to hear how intelligence in policing differs from the military or the civilian side of government or even private sector. Because especially when I was working for you was the difficulties of gathering information and evidence, turning that into intelligence, but still having to have in the back of your mind, it needs to continue to have an evidentiary standard. I think for me, that was like eye opening because I never worked in an environment that that was the standard because it didn't have to go in front of a judge. It depends on what it's going to be used for the mm -hmm. best way. So in the police, if you can run an op that is to gather intel, then you firewall it ready for the evidential gathering piece. So obviously you're never wanting to burn source. So you're always having to parallel your sort, you know, your, your, your intel wherever you can. But ultimately, if it's going to save somebody's life or the crime justifies the need, then that source will be burnt. Because the law, law enforcement is just that. We enforce, we enforce the law. And people expect crimes to be, I suppose, dealt with, to go through the justice process for people to be yeah. put in, into prison. So it's no good us just looking at all our intel and it's great and it's fun and that's as far as it goes. You've got to always make sure that everything you do can either be protected, parallel source to be able to turn in turns or move it forward to be able to go, go into evidential standard. Or what's the point of doing it? Mm. We, you can use it, again, proactively to try and prevent crimes from happening. If the crime's not happening, then you've got no need for then mm -hmm. for evidence. So again, intelligence led policing, you know, making sure your analysts are working where, you know, so you've got your police officers in the right time at the right place to try and prevent burglaries happening, looking at what your trends are, looking at who your suspects are, then going in and proactively looking at who it is that's doing it, put a, you know, put a surveillance team behind them to see if you can catch them before they're doing it or in the process of doing it. So you've got it all, all then. But those stages leading up to it, you've got to remember at any stage could end up having to go to court to prove well, why were you following my client? Why were you doing what you were doing? We do have a lot of protections. Mm -hmm. We have public AI, which is like, is it in the public interest, basically? So it's, a, it's like an immunity to not have to reveal it to an open court, but perhaps just mm -hmm. to the judge or just to the judge and just to the defence counsel, although you wouldn't want to because a lot of the defence counsel will end up telling their, mm -hmm. their clients. So again, what we find, especially mm -hmm. in organised crime cases, is they will constantly try and dig to find who the source was or the informant was because then they know that the whole thing could get thrown out of court because you won't want to burn your source. So they always go and hunt mm -hmm. to try and find the source, to find their to find the leaks to th that got their client in into the court in the first place. I, think, I don't know if that makes sense. So you often find that, you know, especially yeah. very well-connected on those crime groups yeah. will almost have their own analysts doing that to try and work out and trace back, you know, well, how how did it get here? And it's, it, it's all they'll have, you know, they'll try and put insiders and their own informants within the police force. So a lot of the Operations we did were highly confidential, kept within very close-knit teams or squads to try and always keep that intelligence protected. But there is no point being in the police and not being able mm -hmm. to ever get to court because you can't produce anything as evidence. And you're right, the military don't have to be, are not as worried mm -hmm. about that at all. Because, of course, mm -hmm. then obviously we've got the war crimes things. But again, police tend to get a lot more involved in that for them and all will be yeah. there as advisors for them. So it's t it is tough. It is tough. In yeah. the private sector now, I say there's no such thing as intelligence only. Um, it's it's just a waste of it is a waste mm -hmm. of time. Just having intelligence only is especially within the private sector. Yeah. People need to be able to use that, 
And as soon as that's left your control, it's in the mm-hmm. wild, if you like. So, yeah, you you have to you have to really be mm-hmm. careful now with what you're doing with your product. I would push back a little bit because I think you're hundred percent right when we're talking about investigations and maybe security related intelligence. But in some cases, when you're doing forecasting, it's very difficult to then also think about potentially it going to court because there's so many steps, you know, ahead or it is where it cannot go to court. Uh, so in that regard, I think, because what we see, for example, if, if a client main priority is I want to keep my people safe and threat assessments, you know, that you know very well. And I want like a weekly threat assessment or a monthly, or I want you to give me prospects a year out, what to expect. I think to have that also in mind that at the same time, let's create maybe this to an evidentiary standard. I think you kind of already do that in your process and how you handle what you find and how you market. But I think that is not really in the mindset. Of no. Analysts that do yeah. That. No. It, no. That does. And of course, when you're forecasting to try and predict if a, a certain group is going to react, you know, like worse, better, or or you know, in this location or that location, six months time, nine months time, that is, yeah, I I, I get what you're saying that you know that threat assessing and that forecasting, you're not then looking at what we're going to find now and the source the sources we're getting it from now in evidence or or, or in a court no I, I totally understand that but for example let's look at well, not environmental activism and mm-hmm. you know there's some protests that are, are starting to come up if you're then whilst you're looking at trying to predict where they're going to be what they're going to do if you're then seeing um certain things come up in on sites in groups or you see people that are you know on YouTubes or, or the, everything that's very very publicly available and then they are mm-hmm. at a location and they're there putting a brick through a window everything you've gathered up to there especially if they're saying I'm going to go there I'm going to be doing criminal damage mm-hmm. I want as much fuss that all is evidence leading up to them then doing that offence that shows the premeditation, shows they're organised. Do you see what I mean? So that side of it could well be used uh-huh. as then to prosecute them. I mean, should they then just get away yeah. with it um, or not? And I know there's a lot of issues around environmental no. activism, so perhaps that wasn't such a great mm. one because, you know, recent court cases have said they're doing it for, you know, a good reason and so on and so forth. But this is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, if you've got several, especially in the private sector, special intel groups that are all, or intel cells that are working for different corporates that have all been getting that intel, wouldn't it be amazing if you could all then share it and then put it as, mm-hmm. a pos- as a prosecution case. And they say, well, yeah, absolutely. Dave also threw the brick through our window. And, we, you know, and we've, we've got him on YouTube saying mm. this and, well, we've got that. And then you've got this, a really good collection to say, right, goes before a police. And then it's up for a court to decide, well, should he be prosecuted for criminal damage or not? You know, yeah. so, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But from a law enforcement point of view, that's why intelligence is different from yeah, some of the work we do, threat assessing, forecast, mm-hmm. environmental scanning, it's not, it's, it is not going to be used mm-hmm. generally for, uh, as evidence. No, I agree. Mm-hmm. I do think that there is a lack, and I think there is an absolute need within the OSIN community, because uh, I'll talk about mainly the people that actually do create intelligence and do the investigations. I do think they could do with maybe even learning or understanding to whatever means, you know, taking a workshop or, you know, having a proper training on how do you keep evidentiary standard, right? Because what I found while I was working with you was having the prospect in, in the back of your mind that you might have to go to court and defend. (laughs) Luckily, I never had to do that. Obviously, you have plenty. But having that prospect, it absolutely keeps you on your toes. And you mind your P's and Q's because 
yeah, you have to one day, you might one day have to explain yourself. Why did you go through these steps and why did you use this evidence and not that? And how did you label it? Where was it? You know, was it secure? I mean, all the stuff that we went, that I went through while I was working with you and the tensions, for example, with disclosure, right? And maybe you could like go in a little bit about that, about what's the process <laughs> of disclosure? What does that mean? And I think that's very important for people. <laughs> I think that's very important for people to understand that if either are in this industry or want to get into it, I think that's a very important yeah. because I never really knew about that. Disclosure is a whole podcast on its own. But basically, basically, if you are doing a an investigation, and it you know, it can be civil, criminal, a tribune, you know, anything like that, you you should be disclosing to the defence anything that can undermine your prosecution or strengthen basically theirs you don't so basically you're not just giving them all the bits to that shows how guilty they are you've got to give everything that you found you've got to show your methodologies on how you found it and that's interesting you know where bias comes in because all if you've all you've only been searching for is guilt guilt uh -huh. guilt 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 that's when other trains of thought and other research is not completed or interviews done or investigation right. done to look for what if they're not guilty you know do you see what i mean so the disclosure if you always have in mind is that you know if, have i got anything that i'm sitting on that i know will strengthen that 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 defense case or is going to actually undermine the prosecution that's a, that's a really just a very bland, simple way of, of thinking about it. But you will, mm -hmm. you know, you could find yourself in uh, in a court of some description or tribunal having to show your methodology and why you did that, why, you know, why you took that approach or why you didn't. Because if you're involved in an investigation, then often, you know, the analyst will really assist and should be assisting the 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 direction of it you know we make the links we do so that you do the research or you have mm -hmm. a researcher that's doing the research the analyst works really close with that researcher starts making all the link then you sort of dive deeper into that area and then you're forming the investigation team or the senior investigating officer or the lawyer and they think well we, they're getting all this stuff around this person must be this person do you so to me so you can really influence it so yeah d disclosure is is a, I said, a, not, it's not particularly complicated, but it, if you look at some of the her massive cases that fall, especially around fraud and SFO and police with regards to serious, you know, horrendous crimes such as rape that have fallen foul because of lack of disclosure, it's, it's terribly sad. So as Intel mm. analysts, massively, it is something I'd, I'd advise them to have a look at and always have in the back of the mind. Because they can't say, "Oh, I'm just in. I'm just Intel. I'm just an analyst." I, you know, well, we're not. We're not Jack Ryan's. We're not just an analyst. Yeah. In fact, take a leaf out of his book. He <laughs> often works in the field, and that's another thing I really, really encourage analysts to do. If you've got an area that you're looking at, especially from the crime side of things, go and visit it. You know, go and find. If there's an anom anomaly, I remember that yeah. I was doing something on bank tube station once and we all oh, this crime was happening around this I don't know if you were with this on that one I think. and we couldn't understand why this okay. particular I think I can't even remember what the number was because in bank tube they've all got a, you know exit a exit six whatever went there this exit number didn't even exist and mm -hmm. what was happening is they were using this made up number when they were recording crimes and things like that if they nobody really knew where it had happened at that chip. So it's it's just go and visit a geographical area, especially if you're looking at, at crime and crime trends, because it is worth its weight in gold mm -hmm. for an analyst to see that physical side of that place and, and get that feel for it. Really good idea to go into the field sometimes. Tip. I think it also would be good maybe to partner with lawyers or former prosecutors and, and role play, like how it would be like to be questioned, you know, about your, about your analysis and, and the steps that you've taken. I think that's, that could be so valuable because it's only something that I've discovered, you know, while I was working for you. So, all right. So you leave the police when and why? Sort of personal reasons, really. About 2014, 
and thought I'd just take a, a break for about a year. Um, again, all for, for really personal personal reasons. I was, I think, very m- emotionally tired and needed just to take mm-hmm. some time out, and spend some time with my, you know, my family. And, and then I thought, actually, I think I'm just going to have a clean break and go and do something totally different. So I did. So I sort of formally sort of left the police in 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, was a bit lost. I've been institutionalised for you know decades, mm-hmm. really, from the military, then yeah. then the police. But then mm-hmm. found myself on the master's degree course with an amazing chap called Ahmed. And and the rest is the same as history, really. <laughs> that course really, really opened my eyes because, again, yeah. quite institutionalised with the police, very, very narrow. Met some fantastic people. It was a fantastic course, wasn't it? And because I did it part time, I did it over two years, but I was mm-hmm. going in, Absolutely. you know, once a week. So I got to meet, you know, mm-hmm. people over two years from all different, the whole out of the whole globe. Really, it was amazing from security services all over the, all over the globe. Mm-hmm. Great lecturers, which was brilliant as well. And I ended up then going in for a couple of years on military intel as a specialist around serious and organised crime, how it can be used as, you know, as, as sort of a, in the grey mm-hmm. zone, how hostile states could use organised crime to mm-hmm. undermine, destabilise, get what they need into a location. And I really enjoyed that. So I did that a couple of, for a couple of years and doing presentations and working on sort of theories and, and projects and things. And at the same time, set up for secure so I knew I was going mm-hmm. to do stay in the intel world because it, it was my passion um, and doing what I really enjoyed doing which was the intelligence research and analysis part of it and but people forget I think what and um, you know if you've got a good intelligence researchers and, and analysts they can pretty much do you can do your threat assessments you can support big investigations you know you can do it's the trans the transferable mm-hmm. skills are massive you know then go in and look at a whole load of data and see if there's losses and mm-hmm. is that going to be is that linked to crime you know i mean it's i think intel analysts are and you know us in intel researchers are the are fantastic i don't know how any company any agency mm-hmm. can live without us to be fair i <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I give some some people I give a hard time in this podcast, but I do appreciate them and respect them. And you're hundred percent right. I think it's um somebody was mentioning on LinkedIn, I think you've you've talked about this before, that we might now or well, we are moving towards a world where corporates need to create a chief intelligence officer, right? Part of the C suite. And I think that that is happening more and more. Yes, overwhelmingly they're focused on like threat around cyber, but I think geopolitically, particularly if you're a big company, it's becoming something that that definitely impacts, you know, your bottom line. If you're a public company, even more so, as you know, you have clients like that. So my question for you would be, if you had to... Uh, and I know you've trained throughout the years, you've trained a lot of people. If you had to give advice for people that want to get into intelligence in whatever field or ones that are already there. Understand the type of personality you are. You have got to be Mm. incredibly tenacious, self-motivated and have a real problem-solving mind. If you're not those three things you're not going to you're not going to survive or you're not going to be decent at, at, in the intelligence field and the reason being is because you are constantly hunting for something and then the problem solving bit is making those links and being able to answer the so what of what those links so it's no good just you know trawling mm-hmm. through cutting and paste cut and paste cut and paste there you go that's everything we found on joe smith well, that's, well, what does it tell me then? Mm-hmm. Well, well, why have you found all that? Well, was there anything in particular mm-hmm. that sort of stood out? You know, so to me, you know, somebody that calls himself a, an Intel researcher or an Intel analyst, if that's all they're doing, that's that's not that's not my world. 
that's just you know anybody anybody can do that to be mm-hmm. a really good analyst OSINT researcher or intelligence officer you have got to have such a curious inquiring mind yeah you'll jump to the wrong conclusions but that's why analytical techniques are so important to stop you you know you playing you know play your devil's Mm -hmm. advocate do your red teaming do you know your back casting make sure you're using you know anything in the book you can to make sure that you're not coming to the conclusion you want to but you've got to have a tenacious inquiry Mm -hmm. mind you've got to be um, willing I think as well to constantly train and constantly learn look at the new techniques especially in the OSINT world look at what's changing look at what's new in the field don't rely on software i have tried so many different oh we've got we've got this amazing piece of software it will do all this trawling you'll be able to find this person that will tell you everything. no it doesn't and it if you just want a very basic overview then then fine if you're wanting to really dig deep you have to do it you do it manually using various bits to help you build your bespoke search mm-hmm. for, for that that individual or that group or that ge- you know geographical location or that asset you cannot think you can put something into this one sh- you know one one size fits no one piece of software and it's going to drag up everything in fact what it can do is give you false you know false things back saying there's nothing out there oh right there's nothing out there and it's mm-hmm. for me it is that it's that manual hard graft that finds those absolute nuggets and it's frustrating. The other thing is, I don't think, you know, you get these different personality types. If you're a, what I call a complete finisher, you make a brilliant investigator, shall we say, because you see it all the way to the end, to the trial, through that. And as an intelligence officer, nine out of ten times, you'll be compiling it all, putting it into report and releasing it to the, into the wild or to your client and you've got no idea what they end up doing with it, mm-hmm. where they go with it, do they then proceed with it? And you, you've not got to really care because you're then on to the next project. Do you see what I mean? And sometimes mm-hmm. it will sit in somebody's drawer. Yeah. Yeah, if absolutely. you're going to get upset about that, again, wrong job. <laughs> so it's again, you've got to, I think, yeah. look at who you are as an in, as an individual. Okay. Good advice. I think certain things maybe you are born with. Mm-hmm. And certain things you can train. In every podcast, I ask people, what are they reading, watching, listening to? It doesn't have to be intelligence related. It's just more out of interest. Or what people like like us do in their free time, do they continue about what we do? Or I mean, I do, but that's not for everybody. So yeah, <laughs> my question is, what are you reading? What are you watching? So um, watching... <laughs> I tend not to watch anything that's like based on this real. I watch the news. I live on the news. I need to know what's happening geopolitical the whole time. Mm-hmm. But things that are, mm-hmm. I don't know. I try and steer away from things that I know are going to perhaps give me too many flashbacks or, or bad stuff. So I, I don't watch that. The most recent thing that I've watched that I absolutely mm. I thought was brilliant fun was Cleo on netflix which is about the ex east Uh east germany russia slash russian agent during the just before the putting down the the berlin wall it was it's 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 a great watch um i think for uh reading i yeah I, i read loads of stuff around the osint world analytical stuff forums linkedin is absolutely brilliant for that i follow you know, some great groups from Bellingcat through to, you know, other sort of crime analyst things. I love to know, you know, the different techniques that are being used. People's innovative way of, this is what I mean about the problem solving. You know, it's, for when you're doing investigations, there's often Mm -hmm. a, a fixed route you have to check. You know, you have these checkbooks. You must interview this person. You must do that. When you're Intel, it's proactive. You have to think outside the box the whole time, especially with OSINT and Intel work. And I love seeing the clever ways that Intel analysts and researchers have come up with to try and find, you know, where somebody is if they're linked to something. It's Mm -hmm. fantastic. Reading, 
Um, majority of my reading is complete escapism. It is, it's, it's fantasy. It's, it's vampires. Mm. Vampires, werewolves, fairies, just to take me away from the real world. <laughs> I love that. That keeps me a bit sane, I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you on that one. I mean, somebody said it in a, in a former podcast, we read for a profession. So, right? So it's hard to continue reading yeah. things that like to within what we do, right? So I do a little bit, but yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, the time really flew by. Um, and, and actually, you know, I, I haven't touched on it, but I do really want to talk about this a little bit. Normally I, I say goodbye to the, the guest, but I think maybe it's important because you, you, you mentioned it a couple of times. And if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. After you left the police, um, did you struggle with, with, with PTSD? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It was very bad. I had a couple of issues with stars in the police. So I had the, the shooting was pretty mm -hmm. impactive, but I also had to do an awful lot around very serious sex offenders. I had to do a lot of reviewing of cases mm -hmm. and re-interviewing. And then a couple of other pretty horrendous incidents that I got involved in. So unfortunately, the brain can only take mm -hmm. so much. And on top of just day-to-day -day stuff in the police, when you're just dealing with humans having the worst time of their life. They don't call the police just say hi during a cup of tea. They call you because something horrendous happened to them or they're at the lowest point, you know, or mm. and you find them in horrendous situations. So it was that constant build up. I, and I left because I was emotionally tired and I didn't want to make a fuss. I just wanted to go and get on with my life and try and get my strength back up. I did get mm. some amazing help, which which was, was really, really good. It was a lovely lady that dealt with guys coming out of theatre, so she was used to sort of all kinds of trauma. Mm. That that was fantastic. I, I sat there on the first day with my arms crossed thinking, what the hell do you know about my life? You know, this lovely woman sitting in front of me that didn't look like mm -hmm. she'd ever, ever would have even made her go boo, you know, or jump in her life. And she was fabulous. She broke down my barriers and had a few sessions. It was called EDMR, that one. Anyway, I don't know. Anyway, whatever it was, it worked. And that helped me. Unfortunately, a few years later, then it, it, it comes back. And every now and again, I'll, you get the flashbacks. But they're, they're better, you know, now. Mm -hmm. But you, it's part of who you, it becomes part of who you are. I'm really lucky. I've got an ama amazing friendship group. And some of them are ex-military and ex-police. Some stuff I can't talk about because I don't want to scar them, you know, and I don't mm -hmm. want them thinking I'm good grief, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. slightly madder than they think I am already because some of the stuff, because when it comes out in nightmares, it gets really mm. messed up. But mm -hmm. I just, I do, I do, fitness helps me and I said escapism into my books. I'm literally the world's most boring person. Gardening. Mm. You know, do you remember Ahmed, me and you, yeah, when we said that yeah, one, I when I look in the mirror, that. I see this and I said, yeah, when I look in the mirror, <laughs> I see you know, a middle-aged woman who looks like she lives in a herb garden. So that <laughs> that that helps massively. And it's fewer and far between now, you know, it's, as the distance has grown and talking about it. You, so that's interesting. We said, I've never spoken to you about it before. Yeah. I couldn't. And I think because there's so much distance no, now, no. now I am mm -hmm. talking about some of the stuff that I've got involved in. And I'm able to talk about it calmly. Yeah. Doesn't, the adrenaline doesn't spike and it all rushes through me or anything mm -hmm. anymore. So, yeah, 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 that's how I deal with it, I think. But we've all got our traumas. Good for you. Absolutely, absolutely. I had to hear from my significant other that, well, what you're describing is not normal. So maybe you have to talk with somebody. Yeah, thank you so much because um, I think... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people listening and mo a lot of analysts, maybe they, they don't encounter this, but a lot do, you yeah. know, I think they call it vicarious trauma. Even if you're not undergoing it, you know, you're, you're reading about it, you're researching about it. And there's some really good guides on how to manage that. I think Bellingcat has a really good one on how to deal with that. So yeah, I really appreciate you uh, opening up and talking a little bit about it. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you because I think most of the podcasts we did, 
some people with operational backgrounds and, but we haven't really touched upon it, but I think it's good for people to hear that, you know, there's a path forward and I think you're doing amazingly well and the company is doing well. And yeah, so I think you, you deserve every good thing that's happening. So. Thank you very much. I think my parting shot on that with analysts, no, they may not be in the coal face, but a lot of what they do is so impactive to what happens. And some of the intel that we give and mm -hmm. the an analysis that we do can lead to decisions being made on the ground that can have very detrimental or very positive results. And you can Absolutely. suffer from PTSD knowing that mm -hmm. it was your, you know, your intel or, or whatever that perhaps led to those decisions being made. So big thing of PTSD is guilt, the survivor syndrome and things like that. And please talk talk about it because it's not silly it's not insignificant no it wasn't you on that cold face you know mm -hmm. but you were still part of that team you're still part of the operation you may still have known those you know those boys or girls so please don't I suppose make mm -hmm. your part of the trauma insignificant I don't know how I'm portraying that very well I hope that makes sense you know mm -hmm. yeah don't suffer no, in silence are, find so other analysts are, that's what yeah, I'd say <laughs> and talk to them yeah. about it Absolutely. Julie, thank you so much. I've been meaning to do it. And I think you were one of the first names on my list when I started it. Thank you for, for doing it. And uh, I wish you all the best. Where can people find you? On our website, www.b4secure.co.uk um, and on LinkedIn. So, you know. It will be in the show there. notes too. But yeah, so. it was a good show. I love doing mentoring yeah. and coaching as well. I never... Never shy away from that. If anybody wants to drop it, drop me a line or whatever, happy to ever assist with anything like that. One thing that that, I, that really surprised me in a good way is that almost everybody that was guest on this podcast said, if anybody wants to talk or whatever, please get in touch. And, and you said the same thing. So thank you so much for that and uh, have a great day. And talk to you soon for everybody else that's listening thanks guys for tuning in and make sure you give us feedback and if we deserve it give us five stars on spotify and uh, on apple and wherever else you listen to podcasts and because it really helps us and gets the you know gets gets it out and, and talks more about what we do as, as an intelligence community 